Welcome everybody on behalf of uh, Brisker. Good to see you all with the first uh, online workshop this year in the new year. And uh, lovely to, uh, to have you here with us. Uh, today, uh, we are going to have a workshop on how to grow your business internationally. And uh, our speaker of today is Lisanne Jacobs from Brilliant Work. Um, so we've got a few housekeeping um, issues. Can you just uh, pop the slide? Yeah, thank you. So um, feel free to unmute your video for more engagement during this uh, workshop. And, uh, but keep your audio on mute, please. Um, this session will be recorded for future reference and only the shared screen and the speaker, the active speaker will be seen. Um, so if you have any questions whatsoever, uh, please use the chat function in, uh, in the menu below and we'll make sure that uh, Lisanna will address them uh, at the end of the presentation. So I'll give the word to uh, Lisanna and uh, enjoy. Thanks very much, Marion. Um, so I thought before we would all kick off and I introduce myself as well, it's always good to understand who's in the room with us. So um, I don't know if we can do this best by show of hands. Um, or actually no, it might be difficult by show of hands. Um, maybe in the chat function, you can let us know if you um, have already started to, um, I'm sorry, if you're in more in the service business or in physical products. So if you want to show us in the chat. We've got Chris, who's a consultant, and if you guys can just type in the chat, if you can't find it at the, at the top of your screen, there's a chat function. Marco Foggi, physical products, Marae, physical products. Yuri is a startup, he's got service business. And maybe you can also type a little bit about whether you're already exporting or you would like to start exporting. That would also be helpful to sort of see what level people are at. I'll try to make the presentation so that it's interesting for everyone, but that way I can put more emphasis on one or the other. Okay, Hans is a consultant. Yuri, who would like to start? Marco isn't exporting yet either. Okay, so I'll know to start, at least for some people on, um, on a basic level, Nink is a business developer and quality assurance officer, mostly physical products, exporting already in a few countries. Okay. And Chris is helping clients to address their markets. Okay, so it's a bit of a, a mix. People who are wanting to do it, people already doing it, people who are consulting on all of this. So that's, uh, that is great. Um, so what I was hoping you could type in the chat function now is what you're hoping to learn from today. So are you just here to learn generally about the topic of export or have you got any specific questions that you hope we will address today? Don't worry, you won't need to put stuff in the chat function all the time. This is just to get started and to just sort of get a bit of a feel for the room and see, um, where everyone is at and what they're hoping to, to get from the webinar. Um, okay, marketing and regulations. Okay, Sondra, do you want to unmute your microphone? Yes. Okay. Um, do you want to tell me a little bit about what industry you're in and what you're hoping to learn sort of about marketing and regulations, what kind of products? I, I have a service. I am um, a contract manufacturing organism, uh, so producing medical devices. Mm -hmm. So, but the regulations are much more about, okay, uh, invoices, taxes, you know, more general. So not so much uh, specific for my, my business. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and Marco, do you want to unmute your uh, microphone? 
Yes, uh, I started two years ago with a new product concept uh, along with a neurologist. Uh, so we are in concepting phase. So I'm looking forward to, to the future and mm -hmm. uh, and I would like to, to learn from now what are the, the in and outs of exporting. Okay, great. Well, we'll definitely get around to doing all of that and also Yuri's questions about looking at new markets. Now, we have a fairly small group today, so I don't mind if you want to ask any questions, feel free to do so. You don't have to wait right until the end. So you can either do it in the chat function and then um, Marion will give you a shout when you can interrupt and, and sort of ask your question, um, because it does help for me. I can obviously do this presentation and I can just talk for England about exports. Um, but it's much more interesting and much more interactive, obviously, if you guys ask your questions as well. And if I'm going too fast or too slow or anything else, do also please let me know. So you've introduced yourselves a little bit. Um, I shall do the same. So my name is Nizan Jacobs, 48 years old. Um, I live in Holland. I run a coaching uh, and consultancy business called Brilliant Work, which I'll talk uh, about a little bit more in a second. I've been a business coach for 12 years now. And um, why do I think I can tell you a little bit something about exports? Well, it kind of goes back to when I first went to university. I studied international business communications at the Radboud University in Nijmegen. And I didn't quite know what I wanted to do um, work-wise, but I knew it had to be something international. I've always been fascinated about travel and languages and things. Um, and I started working for a couple of Dutch companies and after a few years, one of them, a forklift truck manufacturer, asked me to move to England. Um, so hence I have this accent now, but I am Dutch. Um, so I've worked in the automotive business for a while. I was a European sales manager for a company that made electromechanical components for gaming machines. Um, and my last employer, I was a global account manager for a company that um, provided services and software relating to uh, patterns, trademarks and domain names. Um, and there I had clients like Volvo and Shell and pharmaceutical companies, so very big names. Whereas for some of the other companies, I'd also worked with smaller clients, like small forklift truck dealers in the south of Spain, for example. So I spent about a decade in all, really traveling from country to country to different customers, uh, distributors, working with agents and seeing how everyone could best work together so that the customer would be happy, but we would also maximize the turnover. Um, so I have very hands on experience in you know, being a territory manager, European sales manager, etc. Um, and dealing with these roles. And about 12 years ago, I decided that I wanted a bit of a, a change in my career. So I joined an English group of business coaches called Ology and started coaching small to medium sized businesses. Um, I was still living in the UK at the time because I was working for Yale um, in Holland, in England. And I was voted one of the 50 best consultants over there. Um, and about seven years ago, I moved back to Holland and decided to set up a coaching business here, um, which is brilliant work. Um, and what do we coach people on? Well, it's all sorts of um, things that have to do with entrepreneurship. So it's how to start a business, how to grow a business, how to lead your staff better, um, but also for those uh, uh, companies, those entrepreneurs are interested, how to grow your business internationally. Because obviously it's something that me and a, a number of my other colleagues have great experience in, and that makes the work really interesting and kind of, you know, the um, opportunities for growth almost limitless for businesses. Um, we've been voted the best coaching and consulting business in the Netherlands for small to medium sized businesses uh, in the last two years. Uh, and um, so we're a team of 12, mostly based around Gelderland, but a number of colleagues are based in other provinces as well. And we know firsthand about entrepreneurs. We all have experience as entrepreneurs, um, but also as external coaches. Um, so that's a bit of an introduction and um, we are accredited as well, I should say this, by the Dutch government as well as several provinces to coach with subsidies on topics like exports. So um, 
the, the topic at hand, exports. To give you a couple of numbers, in 2020, the Dutch market exported 483 billion euros in Dutch miljard euros um, and 223 billion euros worth of services, which is a phenomenal amount. So even if you just take a tiny, tiny sliver of that market, it's still absolutely phenomenal. And Holland really is an export nation. Um, and it would be silly if you have a product or service that would extend beyond the Dutch borders not to take advantage of that. Um, but it isn't always easy. So that's why we're doing this webinar this afternoon to explain the do's and don'ts when it comes to export. So these are the numbers for 2020. And that was a bad year, of course, with Corona. So if you look at a normal export year, it would be even more. But I just want, wanted to give you sort of um, the latest figures. So that's the last whole year that there are figures on. So just imagine what a really, really great export year looked like. It would be um, even bigger. Now, the latest figures that have been published are from January to August 2021. And um, I'll just put this here in the corner. Um, this is a list of what kind of products we export. Now, obviously, oil and gas, that's more the prerogative of companies like, um, like Shell. Um, but there are some categories here where you guys might fit in as well. So if you look at medical equipment, for example, that's 8 billion euros. And that's not a whole year. That's just January to August. Um, we've got pharmaceuticals uh, and medication. Um, that's 10.9 billion. And um, in total, it's, it's 370 billion euros in goods that were exported in that phase last year. Um, then what countries do we mostly export to? Well, probably no surprise, but our next door neighbours are the ones that we tend to trade with the most. So Germany, as you can see, by far is our biggest trading partner. Um, so the light blue line is January to August last year and the dark blue line is the year before. And you see that's only increased. So actually in Corona times, we found it even easier to kind of just deal with our next door neighbours. Um, Belgium, even though it's got a much smaller population, we trade with massively, followed by France, United Kingdom, United States, Italy, etc. You see it really declines from there. Um, but really, most companies that I deal with as well, most of our clients, what they tend to do is they first look to see what countries are close by, can I easily drive to, go and see my customers, I'll try those first. And then the US always has a massive appeal just because, you know, culturally we're so linked and it is, of course, a big market. Um, I do sometimes come across people who go like, well, it can't be that hard, can it? I'll just, you know, translate my website and I'll start selling abroad and that's it. Um, or people who sit on their hands for a long time and think, well, I'm going to wait for the ideal time to start exporting and it just takes forever. So I'll just write down some of the most common mistakes so we can avoid them. And of course, later on in the webinar, I'll give you the tips of what the best things are to do when it comes to exporting. So first of all, wrong time. You know, they're either going far too soon when they haven't really tested their products and it's not quite working yet in the Dutch market or for any customers. Um, or they wait far too long. You know, it could have been out there longer and the longer you wait, the more chance that either the market has found something else or someone has copied your product or your service, for example. Um, so you really want to go as soon as you have things under control here. As soon as you know what you're doing with your product or your service and you know you can thoroughly deliver it, um, then that is the best time to sort of start working on, on international sales. I see a lot of companies that are really, really poorly prepared. So they don't really do any research. They don't look at um, the potential in the market. They don't look at their competitors. They don't look at the legislation. They just go. And what usually happens is that sales then are very disappointing. And then they say, well, you know, the market just wasn't ready for us or, um, you know, we tried and it failed. And often it wasn't because the market wasn't ready. It was usually because 
the company itself wasn't ready to do exports and to do it properly. Um, not enough commercial drive. I see this a lot too. So people sort of waiting for customers or distributors to approach them and to say, we want this now, can you please sell to us? Um, but you really need to have a strategic drive and a desire to make it abroad. Um, and you have to put the effort in as well. It doesn't just happen overnight. You have to put time or money into it or both. Um, so that's really important and to really think it through. You know, I sometimes come across clients who have started selling their products in the Far East and haven't really even sold anything in Europe, even though their product was perfect for the European market. But they just bumped into someone from from the Far East who said, oh, I'll take your product. And then have gone through a lot of due diligence and having to, uh, you know, to get their products approved. Whereas actually starting in Europe might have been a lot easier. Um, so that's a, a common mistake um, and a lack of a long term strategy. So it's easy enough to think, well, how are you going to sell your first few products or get your services into the first few clients? But what is it you really want to achieve in the next three years, five years, 10 years? And how are you going to make sure that that same customer or that same distributor keeps coming back to you for more? And that's really important because that is how you're going to set up your exports from day one with both a short term and a long term view. Um, and the wrong markets, uh, which I just already uh, touched upon. Um, and the last mistake that I see a lot is just kind of reinventing the wheel. So most business owners or export managers don't really know what kind of support there is out there. Like I said, Holland is a real export country. We do this phenomenally and therefore there is a lot of support you can get. You can get advice, you can get money, um, you can get contacts, all sorts of things, which I'll talk about later in another slide. So don't try to figure out everything for yourself. You don't need to, um, but we'll come to that in a, in a minute. So when are you um, ready? Well, like I said, if you really know your own market, your own products uh, or your own service, now, of course, there can be exceptions. I know some products, if you're doing something in tropical agriculture, you're probably going to sell it abroad sooner than here. This is not the climate for it. So there might be products or services that are better off started uh, abroad. But most of the time you want to start here um, and just think from day one, how soon would I like to go abroad and how much preparation will that take? So. If I want to start selling in Germany in six months time, do I need to start preparing things now? If I want to sell in Japan next year, how long in advance do I need to get market information, get my product accredited, find a distributor, etc. So for everyone, that point in time will be different. Um, but you want to think about it as soon as possible. And then the question is, of course, um, like Yuri said, where can I go? So I look at four factors, really, when um, determining which countries you start with first. First of all, I would say, see what is the easy way. So what are the countries where I already have some contacts or it's not going to take very long to drive and meet the customer in person or anything else that will just make my life easy? Because you don't want to start somewhere really difficult. Um, I also look at the competition really important so don't just go into a market that you know might have very little demand and a lot of competition you want to see where there's enough of a gap for you where people are already dissatisfied with the current uh, providers of that service or that product um, or where there are no competitors at all if there are no competitors at all you do need to see if there is a market for you because if no one else has jumped into that gap is that for a reason or not um, we have a question from Chris. What is your experience regarding the mistake of not knowing the language and the character and uh, the mindset of prospects of your intended markets? Well, um, it is really important. I've seen this go wrong so many times. So people think that um, everyone will speak English and that's fine and you'll get by and you don't. So, for example, if you're dealing with um, Germany, you, you get so much more respect from businesses and you will get so much more turnover if you have someone in your business 
preferably multiple people who speak fluent uh, and faultless German, for example. And there are a lot of countries where, you know, you can't get by with English, where they just don't have anyone who speaks English. Um, so you either have to speak the language yourself or have a local representative, for example, who speaks the language. Um, because otherwise you simply won't get the business. And even if you do sell the first order, the first batch, at some point there will be a, a problem in the communication. And if you don't speak the language, if you're not on the same page, you will get a conflict, it will get a, a, a fallout, an argument, and then the whole thing falls apart. And there is a difference, and, and Chris Bartley says, uh, the language and, and both the character, the mindset as well is important. So one of the mistakes, for example, I see when people speak English is that they think because we use the same words, we understand each other. Um, but there are a lot of subtleties. So for example, if I try to sell this glass to an English person, I go, this is an awesome glass. So just the right height and the right content. And you know, you can look through it, it's transparent. Um, don't you think it's awesome? An English person might say, that's very interesting. To which a Dutch person will usually go, oh, interessant. Oh, I think it's interessant. You know, he finds it interesting. That's that's fantastic to, to us Dutch people. If someone says that's interesting, we tend to mean it and actually think that, you know, we might want to take this further and maybe buy this glass. To an English person saying that's interesting is just a polite way of saying, I'm not interested at all. I don't care about it. You can take this, this glass with you because I'm never going to buy it. So, understanding the, the the mindset of the other person which can be a language thing uh it can be a culture thing you know english people won't always tell you how they feel exactly about you especially if they don't know you that well yet um but it can also be you know about understanding the character so going back to the german example for example they are much more careful before they will start dealing with a new supplier to them, it's really important to have a long term relationship and to have done everything correctly. No mistakes. Um, everything is done by the book. If you come in and you give a presentation, you better be able to answer all the questions about your product. Otherwise, you're unprofessional. If you're late, you're unprofessional. So you do have to understand these things before you go into a market. And you're never going to get it 100 percent right. That's really, really difficult. Um, but you can try to get it right as much as possible. And when you're dealing with um, people abroad, find out as well if they have any experience of doing um, business internationally as well, because the more international experience they have, the more they are likely to sort of understand if you slip up a little bit. Whereas if they're used to just people coming to them, um, they will just think, it's your mistake or that you are doing something wrong if it doesn't quite um, add up, if you don't really connect, if the, the transactions aren't going smoothly. Um, Chris, does that kind of answer your question? Yes, certainly. <laughs> I was looking for the unmuting. Yes, certainly. It is a good answer. OK, great. Thank you. Keep the questions coming. It's, it's very helpful. Um, the next thing I look at is legislation. So are there any laws that tell you whether or not you can sell your product or your service into that country? And even if you can, if maybe it needs to comply with different rules. So, for example, if you're going to sell a product to Germany and it's got batteries in it, you need to comply with battery pack, uh, legislation. Same thing with packaging legislation in Germany. So. You might think, well, the, the EU is the same wherever you go. It's not. There are some things that are different. Um, when I used to sell components for gaming machines many, many years ago, um, we couldn't sell them in France because in France, having a fruit machine, a casino machine or a slot machine, as you, you might know it, um, was illegal. Um, and in Italy, it wasn't illegal, but they all had to be a certain size, which meant that our components also had to be smaller than the components we sold in most of the world. Um, so these sort of things are really, really important to know. They're usually not that hard to find out, but they will very much determine if you should choose to go to a country at all, 
and whether you should do that first or maybe keep it lower down the priority list later and just do the easier countries first. Um, the other thing that comes into play here as well is, for example, um, patent and trademark law. You know, are there things that maybe you can or can't register over there or that someone else has already registered, maybe one of your competitors? Um, so you do have to look into the law aspect. Um, people usually find that quite scary, but you can get help for this. Um, and you kind of just do one search usually and then you're, you're pretty much done. So don't let it scare you off too much. Um, and the, the last thing we look at, um, but not un unimportant, of course, is the market itself. Is there anyone waiting for you for your products? Do they have a need for it? Do they understand that they should really buy it? You know, if you came around um, or do they think it's not necessary. Um, have they got the budget to buy it, for example? And if we're looking at healthcare, um, every country is different. So the way we purchase our healthcare in Holland differs greatly from the United Kingdom, for example, where you have a national health service which runs most of the hospitals and the, and the general practitioners, the family doctors, although there is a commercial arm as well to healthcare. And here in Holland, everything goes through all of these insurance companies. So every country is different. So you're dealing with the market in the sense of the end user maybe, but also the whole system. How are things bought? Um, who do you have to go and see about actually selling your, your product or your service? And are they ready? And you might think that your product is amazing, um, but every country will see it differently. So over here, we use LinkedIn all the time, but in Germany, for example, they use Xing and they say, well, Seeing is fine. Why would we go over to, to LinkedIn? Um, so it's not even about the technical specs sometimes of your products or the you know, different aspects of your service. It really is about what the market wants and what the market needs. So what do you have to um, look at when you're going to a different country? Well, um, as Chris pointed out, one of them is the language. Um, I do think sometimes people give this too much weight. So I come across a lot of clients who say, what we're going to do is we're going to start exporting to the United States because we speak English and we've watched a lot of CSI. We like the accent. We'll just go to, to America. Um, but that doesn't always help. You know, if you have someone in the company that could help you with the language aspect, if you could hire a translator or a local agent, someone who speaks English, you can get around this barrier. So I would look much more at the market um, to decide where to go. But if you do then go, then make sure that you do speak the language and that all your uh, product information or your service information is in, in the local language. And it's really, really important. Um, I used to work for, um, for an English company. And if we had a training day, they would invite people from Germany and France and different places and they would give the training in English and say, well, everyone can understand because the company language is English. But I would speak to my colleagues and they would afterwards moan a lot of the time, the, the Germans, for example, and they would say, I kind of understood about half, maybe two thirds of what was said in the um, in the course because it's not my native language. And if you really want to get an opening and to sell your product or your service to someone, they have to understand 100% of your message. So wherever you're using language, written or spoken, make sure it is available in the local language of the country that you're trying to sell to. Um, that goes, for example, for your website, of course, for your brochures, but also if people want to file a complaint or ask a question, you know, your customer service, uh, technical specification documents, manuals, anything to do with your product or your service should be available in that language. Um, culture is of course very important. Um, here in Holland, we are very low on hierarchy. So we're very uh, um, quick to just use people's first names, for example. And if we have a meeting and there's the boss and there's several people reporting to the boss, we will sort of give everyone equal attention and expect there to be a group decision made on the customer side about whether they will buy a product or not. Whereas there are a lot of cultures where that's not the case at all, where there's a much bigger 
um, regard for hierarchy. The boss decides, you look at the boss to see what he or she wants to do. Um, and, you know, where it's really important to address people with their surname, for example. So I've dealt with customers, you know, for years on end, where as much as we got on, you know, where there was a, a real connection, we liked each other, and we could sometimes even joke a little bit, we still use the surname, and they would do that even with their, their colleagues. So make sure that you observe what's going on culturally. Try to read up or find out about the culture of the country that you're dealing with and try to go along with their culture where you can. And if you feel like you can't do that or you don't want to do that, um, you might want to, in a sort of lighthearted way, explain how you do business in your country, in your culture. And that is, you know, how you would like to do it. Um, just so people don't un understand because otherwise they won't understand and they will find you rude or arrogant or too quick or whatever and you don't want to do that so try to be sensitive when it comes to, to culture and a lot of the time you know we might think everyone's on the internet we're all watching the same movies we're all on youtube we all think the same we don't culture even with young people is still determined to a large extent by a country. Um, logistics, how are you going to get your product over there? Um, you know, especially if this is a physical product, um, but even if it's a service, I recently spoke with someone who said, oh, I'm just going to uh, uh, translate my platform and then I'm going to supply to that country and I'll be done. And I said, that's true. But as soon as you have a, a domain name with the, the, the country extension to it, in some countries, that means that you then have to uh, comply with their legislation. Um, that's not physical logistics, but it's sort of, you know, uh, um, in, in terms of legislation, logistically, you're in that country. If you're talking physically about getting there, I was actually at a customer's um, uh, today and they were going to have a, a demo uh, machine being sent to an international exhibition and it was stuck in a harbour. And they're not going to get it there in time for the exhibition. So that's really difficult. So logistics are super important. And as soon, especially if you're starting to export anywhere outside of the EU, which is already Switzerland, Norway, the United Kingdom. Um, and of course, as soon as you, you sort of leave Europe, um, you know, you want to make sure that you've done fulfilled all the paperwork, that you've got the right logistics company. Um, who can get there and get your product there safely. Um, so very, very important. Um, any questions so far? Or if there are any questions or any comments, do please let me know. Either turn on your microphone or, um, or, or type it in the chat. Um, then certification, you know, especially if we're talking about um, medical or high tech products you might need to have certification either to be able to sell into that country from a legal perspective but also to prove to your clients that your product uh, or your service is actually any good um, so certification can often take a long time and be quite costly um, and so it's often important to get someone in who's done that sort of thing before um, because what well, otherwise you'd be reinventing the the wheel and you want to look into it well in advance and say see which countries would i like to get to and what certification do i need and is it the same can i use the same certification throughout europe for example um insurance it's up to you whether you use insurance or not um, but sometimes it can be very handy um, just to also limit your liability so for example i had a customer once who was selling um, uh, solar products made in China and selling them to South America. Now, if someone had stolen the shipment or if the boat had sank or whatever, she wouldn't have had the money to, uh, to have it all manufactured again and deliver it again. So by having insurance, that really gave her the peace of mind that if anything happened with it, um, the company wouldn't go bankrupt. So insurance can be important. Um, this one for an exclamation mark, distribution channels, massively important. The quickest and easiest way to sell, especially physical products, is to have a distributor 
or an agent. And most people I speak to, they think they know the difference between the distributor and an agent, um, but not quite. <laughs> Usually you don't. So a distributor is someone who will buy the products from you, store them themselves. They will usually have service mechanics if it's a complex product, and they can basically do anything otherwise that you would need to do in that local country. So your responsibility basically kind of goes to as far as here's the delivery, you go and deal with the customer, we don't need to do anything else. So a distributor usually is slightly bigger, it doesn't have to be, but it's usually at least two people, sometimes 100, 200 people, or even bigger. Um, and they usually have a more professional, extensive setup. An agent is basically a freelance salesperson. So they will have one or multiple brands that they um, represent, but they will only do the sales for you. They might help if the customer has any aftermarket sort of questions, but they don't tend to have storage facility. They don't tend to have all sorts of equipment to um, service the products. So it's very handy in a country where you just want to go in and make the sales because usually their commission will be smaller. They will charge a commission on what they've sold. Whereas a distributor will say, this is the price that I'm buying it from you. And then I'll have my own markup on it. Now, not everything's black and white. There can be some setups that are a little bit between a distributor and an agent, but that's roughly the division. And you don't have to do it the same way throughout. So depending on the complexity of the market, the products or the services, you could choose to do the Netherlands or the European Union yourself, maybe have agents in some other small markets and then have distributors in other big markets where you wouldn't have the time or the, the setup to be able to serve lots of different customers. Um, this is the super easy and quick way to grow your business. However, it often goes wrong because people don't really think about what distributors um, they appoint. Um, so they go, uh, 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 they go and make a deal with a company that hasn't got a good reputation in a particular country or hasn't got the right mechanics or hasn't got the right salespeople. So it's really important to check up, to vet your potential distributors before you sign an agreement. And secondly, don't just give them exclusivity. I've come across this before where someone is so happy to found a foreign distributor that they then sign away their rights for all the future. You don't want to do that. So a distributor or an agent might ask for exclusivity for their country, which is fine, but I would only give it to them for a certain amount of time or if they are hitting their targets every year. So you have to set up targets and say, look, if you sell 100,000 euros worth of products every year or 100,000 in the first year and 150,000 in the next year, for example, you can keep exclusivity. If you fail targets, we need to talk. I'm not immediately going to take away your exclusivity. You know, like, for example, in, in, a, in a corona year, if you don't sell because all the hospitals were closed, I'm not going to take away the exclusivity. But if I see that you're not putting in the marketing effort or something else is wrong, I have the opportunity to take it back. So that is really, really important um, in dealing with distributors and to manage them every year, every quarter, every month, like you would do your own staff. So make a plan of what you're going to do together of what support they need from you. Do they need photos, do they need videos, do they need product specifications? What is it that they need to do their job well and to represent you well and to sell lots of your products or your service? Um, so that's really important. Um, just looking to see who it was who was already selling a little bit. Um, Oh, that was Sandra, actually. Sandra? Do you want to turn on your mic? I don't know if Sandra managed to get back in. I think I saw her get, get out and then come back in. Is there anyone who's already selling internationally who wants to weigh in on this?
Well, Sandra is, uh, is out again, so I think she's got some uh, computer problems. Oh dear, okay. <laughs> Well, we'll just continue then. Um, then the next thing to think about is, you know, we've looked a lot outside at the market and, and the legislation and everything else, but look inside your own company. Do I have the capacity to, um, if I have any customer service questions, do you have enough customer service people? Can I ramp up my production capacity enough? If I get more orders, can I actually process them, etc.? Because sometimes actually being successful in Holland or internationally can kill your business as well. Because if you then can't supply on time or you can't deliver quality, etc., people will leave and you won't get the long term sales. So look very much at do I need to ramp up both in terms of volume to get more capacity, but also do I have the right skills within the company to, to deal with, you know, successful exports. Um, payment terms um, are important and will vary from country to country. So in Holland, 30 days is quite normal, um, sometimes even 15 days. Be careful in every country, there will be a different norm to when they will pay and how they will pay as well. Um, whether it's a bank transfer or something else. Um, so don't just assume that people will go along with your payment terms, discuss them. Um, you don't always have to do what they dictate, but especially if they are a bigger party than you are. Sometimes you can be a small company, maybe three or four people, and the person or the, the company that you're selling to has 5,000 employees and a much bigger turnover than you. They probably won't go along with your payment terms. So years ago, I was in the forklift truck business, and one of our biggest clients in Spain was a supermarket chain. And they said, we want to buy a huge number of forklift trucks from you in one go. We've got our own mechanics. We don't need you to come in and service them. But if we buy them, it's 180 days payment terms. And we've never done that anywhere in the world. But because it was such a big order, um, we decided to go for it anyway and give them 180 days payment terms because they said, if you don't do it, we will just buy them from Toyota. Um, so that's something to think about. Um, you might need to amend your products or your service. So the way this pen, uh, what it looks like, this black pen, if I wanted to sell this in a different country, they might want it in purple, or they might want it to be you know, longer or shorter, or um, write in a, you know, with a thicker line of ink or thinner. So do check with your potential customers what they expect from your product or what they would like. And obviously there's a give and take in there. Um, you know, sometimes you have to just go with, with the market and say, this is what I would like to offer. Do you like it? But do keep your eyes and ears open to see if there's things that will make it sell better in that country. Um, I touched upon it a little bit earlier, intellectual property. Make sure you are aware of what you can do in terms of uh, patents, trademarks and domain names and copyrights in different countries. Um, so copyright is just a, a given, you don't have to pay for it, you just put the little C in copyright on any of your written materials. Uh, it also goes for software, by the way. Um, but domain names and trademarks and patents, you can register. Now, it can be quite costly, so don't just register everything in all countries without thinking about it, because it will just cost a huge amount. But do find out what has already been registered in terms of patents and trademarks in your area, in the countries that you'd like to sell to, or the countries where you'd like to produce your products in, um, and then weigh up how much it would cost um, to register these, because they are a real deterrent. And if anyone tries to copy your products, it's much easier to go to court and prove that you were the first one to have it. Um, other legislation we've already talked about, things like packaging um, or gaming law, so do uh, um, define this out. So these are just a number of the things to look at. And um, they, they are sort of the main ones. But there's always new ones you need to think about. Um, this is a really good starting point if you cover all of those. Um, what government support is available? I say governments. 
the government in Holland, I found out when I moved back here seven years ago, isn't just one place. <laughs> so there's your local government, your council, there's the province, there are different ministries, there are, there's embassies, there are so many different parts of the government chain. They're all happy to help. And some are specialized in exports and business and some aren't. Um, and it's really fragmented. So that's the downside. The plus side is there is a lot of support. So you can get subsidies to help you with your exports because the Dutch um, economy really depends on exports and therefore the Dutch government really wants to support this. Um, you can get free information. So if you want to know about legislation or about your uh, competitors abroad, etc., or about networks of potential clients, you can find all of this out. Um, what can be helpful as well is to go on trade missions. So you can go with uh, a minister or the king um, and a whole delegation of people from your industry. So they're, they're usually based around a theme, let's say uh, water or healthcare or smart cities, et cetera, et cetera. And it can be a quick way to get into contact with the right people. Um, and there are, of course, other ways to network as well, to find parties that you can cooperate with or sell to or sell via. And um, the, the government already obviously has quite a lot of network, but they don't know how to use it. They don't know how they can help you. Um, so you first need to make a plan of what is it that you actually want? Do you need money? Do you need contacts? Do you need information? Do you need all of these? And do you need them all at the same time? Or what do you need first? Um, so that's really important is to write your export plan. And it doesn't have to be a hugely long plan or usually long document it's for you so if it's in keywords uh, or very short phrases that is absolutely fine um actually before i go on to anything else um is everyone still okay following it all okay Okay, Marai can still keep up. Yuri as well, good. Marco's with it. Okay. Awesome. And um, as well, good, good. I'll I'll continue then, but do feel free to let me know if you have any questions. Um. So some. Oh. That's a shame for Sana. She had a bit of a bad connection. She missed a lot. We are recording all of this as well. So, of course, you can watch it later, uh, the bits that you missed. So some of the most applicable subsidies that you can um, go for. There is a subsidy here in uh, Gelderland and Alverijssel for businesses that are less than five years old. You can get a subsidy to help you, um, you know, write these plans. So that's one that we use a lot. There's also one in Gelderland that is either aimed just as businesses, uh, a businesses that want to grow or that want to start exporting. That's 10,000 euros a year. And for the last four or five years, we've used the subsidy um, that helps businesses that want to grow internationally. That you wouldn't have to pay anything for at all. The government just paid our whole bill and to help you write an export plan. Um, unfortunately, that subsidy is nearly finished, but we do expect a new one to come in its place. So if you're interested in that, just let me know and I can keep you posted as and when a new one's come in. We're currently working for the last bits of the, the remaining budget there. So if we do get a lot, if, if a lot of companies get turned down on their applications, there might still be some room in this quarter as well um, to get free export coaching from us. This is a screenshot of our Dutch uh, website, but we also have an English version of the website. If you prefer, we have a subsidy page uh, on, so it's brilliantwork.nl, just brilliant work, all in English. And there's a whole list of all the subsidies that we currently use. They're not all related to export. Some are just about business growth or professionalization, um, but they are all very helpful. Um, might be easy, to, good to mention, um, in March and April, we'll be doing a two and a half day group course on how to conquer Germany um, uh, in a professional way. And uh, we'll be holding that in Arnhem. 
So that will be a physical course, two days of learning about the ins, uh, the ins and outs of the German market and legislation and how to commercially have success in Germany and in half a day to present your export plan. Um, so um, I've given you a lot of information and sometimes it might be hard to sort of, you know, store it all and figure out what you need to do first. Um, so where we really help is to sort of go through it all. So what's your company doing now? What's the situation at the moment? Are there any subsidies that are applicable to your company? Um, if you haven't done so already, we help you write down your goals. So where do you want to be in, let's say, three years time? Which countries do you want to have conquered? How much turnover do you want? Um, what else would you like to achieve with your business? And then we work backwards and say, OK, what do you need to do to achieve all of this? What, what needs to be your export strategy or your business strategy? And it's easy enough to write a plan. But the difficult bit is to actually put it into practice and not let the day to day running overtake things. So where we really help as well is to come in and sit down with you maybe once a month, for example, and say, well, how's it all going? Everything that's in the plan that you're going to do, have you got the network to get it done? Or do we need to introduce you to people? Have you got the knowledge, the marketing information? Or shall we help you obtain all of that? Um, have you got the experience or the skills to make all of this happen? So we, we keep supporting you until you've really put the whole plan into place and um, you've got the success that you wanted. And apart from subsidies for our own coaching fees, we do also know about subsidies, for example, for registering a trademark internationally or attending a, a trade fair or doing anything else that um, you need to do to get your exports done. So, um, you know, we're always happy to, to advise on all of that. Um, so, oh yeah, what I forgot to mention is we don't come and do it all for you. So we tend to sit down with you for maybe two hours at a time and um, go through all of this journey. And some customers stay with us for three months and then they have all of their answers. And we also have clients that we've helped for over five years and, you know, still like the support because their business keeps growing and developing um, and we're there for, for them for every stage. Um, so, ah, good question. Uh, is all the coaching done by one person? That varies. So in the team, so like I said, there's 12 of us. Some of us have a very broad background. So my background is, you know, sales, marketing, customer service, leadership, uh, um, uh, entrepreneurship. But we also have some people who are really focused on digital marketing, for example, or on HR, or in terms of industry, um, you know, I have David, for example, who's really focused on agricultural, food, beverage. Um, I have Danny, who in terms of, of countries or areas is very much focused on Africa. So it depends. Um, for some entrepreneurs, it's better to have one business coach because they're the person who really knows you and knows your business and can answer most of your questions. But sometimes your questions might be so specific that it's better to have a combination of different coaches, either at the same time or first, you know, you might start off with one coach and then get another coach after a while. Um, so that really depends. Um, does that answer the question? I don't know if you're from Marion or, or Marika. I was assuming it's a yes because I haven't heard anything else. Um, great. So, so um, oh, yeah, Hans is asking, how important is a startup ecosystem in the regional area for the business of a mainstream company? Hans, do you want to turn on your microphone and just expand on that a little bit? Yes, I was wondering um, what you are telling us now and, uh, mm -hmm. and the, the, the totally coaching engagement. Uh, that's mm -hmm. very good that, uh, that, that there is an engagement like this. But I was wondering if you are a mainstream business and you're doing your international business, how important it is to have a startup ecosystem. And I, I'm asking this because I'm interested uh, if, they, if there is an advantage for the mainstream business they might also uh, co-create with startups 
or co-create uh, an ecosystem to develop their own business also better. Okay, I'm just trying to understand because you're saying, you know, it's a, it's a mainstream company. So what does it do, like like bookkeeping or something or marketing? No, it could also be in health and high tech. So, mm -hmm. uh, so you have, when you have a mainstream uh, uh, beyond this, by example, mm -hmm. uh, for instance, here in the region. So that when you have a mainstream business in this region, how important is it for these companies? And to work together or to help building a startup ecosystem uh, in the same market. Okay, yeah, I understand. Um, I think it's very important because obviously today we've mostly talked about exports, but in, in general, if you're talking about entrepreneurship and growing, uh, uh, growing businesses and making sure that entrepreneurs feel successful, that they have the financial resources, that they have the information, that there's like energy, that people are helping each other, that you're creating synergy, then it's really important to have these ecosystems. So um, what I find quite fascinating is because we're based in Osterbeek next to Arnhem. I see how it's different in Wageningen, in Arnhem, in Nijmegen, but also, for example, in the United Kingdom where I used to live. And the support system around you um, really determines quite a lot of the time your success. There are some companies that will be successful regardless. But if you have a good infrastructure where, you know, the circle tree, circle helix, you've got uh, education, you've got the government, um, you've got commercial businesses all helping each other. And there's physical locations where people can sit and start a business where you have uh, workshops, presentations, courses being held, lightning talks, all of these things, they help create this atmosphere and this network as well, where all of a sudden it transcends what one company could do. So it is massively important. I don't think it can be um, underestimated how important it is, because otherwise having a company setting it up and growing it can be a really, really lonely business. And um, as useful as it is to have maybe a coach come in once a month and help you, having this ecosystem um, where there's things happening on almost a daily or a weekly business is a fantastic uh, addition to that. So, yes, very, very important. Do you know examples of uh, mentoring business who invest in the ecosystems? Um, well, on a, on a smaller scale, for example, so we're partners of startup Nijmegen and Star Club Arnhem and we see that people you know the entrepreneurs join those kind of uh, uh, company uh, kind of organizations and locations obviously we're a partner of Brisker as well so you know that's an ecosystem um, so there are a lot of different ecosystems that some have an overlap and some don't and some business owners will choose to you know become a member or go to these events or or rent in an office location where there's a whole ecosystem happening and some don't. Um, but I think if they are serious about it, then often they will. Okay, that is because I'm asking this because most of the time I see a lot of services, uh, service companies who are uh, very interested in the ecosystems, but they are most of the time uh, well, let's say small or medium enterprises. They are not the, the large mainstream uh, companies. Mm -hmm. And I'm really interested uh, when I say about uh, medical, like uh, companies like Beyondis or Novartis or the real big companies, mm -hmm. what's their advantage to invest in an ecosystem? And I'm looking for those companies who might uh, or thinking about investing, investing in an ecosystem, like, for example, uh, the health and high-tech ecosystem in uh, this region. Ah, okay, now I understand your question. Yeah, you talk from the, the, the um, large corporates point of view. It, it depends on their um, uh, mentality. So if they see this ecosystem as a great way to get innovation, for example, so companies like Apple, for example, a lot of their technology in their phones isn't from them it's from small businesses that they either buy up or they buy the patent or whatever. So it's in their interest to be surrounded by and in connection with a whole ecosystem of SMEs. Um, so some companies say, well, 
you know, we are just in this particular industry, all we do is we, we make pens or we make headache pills. We only want to speak to companies who are in this industry. And so they will go and look for these smaller companies, but they won't really invest in them. They will just hope they will meet them at a trade show and they don't feel a need to invest in them. Um, but if, of course, you're a larger company and you really want to think about this and think about your environment and how to sustain yourself in the long term with all of your stakeholders, which is also your physical location and uh, future employees, etc., you will reach out and you will engage with both students and maybe teach at a local university or even secondary schools or primary schools. And you'll also engage with local entrepreneurs and invest in those relationships uh, because they can become your suppliers or your innovators, etc. Um, but not every large corporate has that mindset. A lot of them feel, you know, we're big, we're giants, we don't really need any help. We don't need to look outside of our walls. Um, but if they're clever, they will reach out and they will support this uh, local ecosystem. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so uh, the big question, I think, is, you know, you, you might have taken a number of notes today or thought, well, I'll just wait for the recording to, to come and then I'll look at it again. But really, what are the things that you've taken away from today? What are the things that you're going to do something about or investigate more? Um, so that'd be quite interesting. So, for example, um, uh, Yuri. Hello. Um, probably the most interesting for me is going to be to look at different uh, distribution model for services businesses in other countries, especially in Netherlands, and um, you know, having service internet-based service business, I do not think about too much about different distribution models, and I believe it will be the right topic to think about. Okay, awesome. Uh, Nika. Yes, no problem. Yeah. So is there anything that you've taken away from today or that you're thinking of doing anyway in terms of um, of your exports? Yeah, it's very good to overthink the process. We have been um, caught up in some processes, which were nice, uh, mostly by using um, external uh, channel partners. Mm -hmm. It would be good to also put it more internally and um, to go from there. So um, this really helped me with thinking what steps can we take there and how can we start that? Okay, great. And um, uh, Marco, is there anything that you're going to do or do more of or less of? Thank you, Lizanne, for this question. Um, yes, uh, first of all, since uh, 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 I'm in a, in a start phase of uh, making a, a wearable, a product, Mm -hmm. I'm interested in looking firstly in the IP strategy, uh, uh, government support and certification. And mm -hmm. then uh, after all the other aspects for the future from now, just to, to analyze the risks and mm -hmm. uh, to, to look uh, how to mitigate these risks or avoid uh, some problems in the future. Good, so you're gonna do some desk research next. Yes, yes, it, it, it has to be done now because uh, 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 we are not a, a, a big company. We are only three people at the moment, so I cannot mm -hmm. say we can do everything in uh, in a short time. In short time, so mm -hmm. that's why. Okay, great. Um, so I don't know if anyone has anything else that they they're going to do as a result from today or that you're thinking of doing anyway as the next step in your exports? Um, but if there's no one who has any other steps, are there any other questions? I do. What is yeah. the, 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 the most common pitfall 
when uh, that people will uh, will have before they come and contact you? Um, a lot. Luckily, most of the time when people contact me, it's when they haven't actually done that much exports yet. So they haven't done anything yet, or they've just done a little bit and they realise that they want more. Um, but the mistakes that they've made when they have gone internationally is often around the distributors, which is why I made such a big point of, of this, is I once had to deal with a client, um, a cosmetics company, who had an exclusive distributorship for the whole of North America. And this relationship was going really sour and the local distributor had registered their trademark and their domain name and everything in their own name. So not, not my client's name not the original manufacturer of the product, but they had done it. And then I had to go and, and sort of clean up the mess and sort of deal with this massive argument that was going on between them and trying to figure out how we we're going to get the trademark back, the domain name back, how we could escape from this exclusivity and find different distributors. Um, and I've also had clients who, you know, like I said, started in the wrong country. So they immediately appointed distributors in really small countries with small market potential and a huge amount of certification and paperwork and not really thought through of where do I actually want my distributors and what rights do I want to give them. So that's especially if it's a physical products kind of uh, company, really important. When it comes to services, there's other things to think about. It's, it's usually more the liability and what areas I'm actually trading in because it's a bit more fluid when you talk about services, but those are sort of the main mistakes that I, uh, that I see. Um, Thank you. What I forgot to mention is we have a newsletter, which comes out only every two months or so via email. Um, it's full of information about subsidies for your business, uh, tips on what to do, more webinars or workshops that we're giving away, uh, that we're doing for free that you can hook on to. Um, if you're interested in the newsletter, um, just let me know. Marion will send out my contact details afterwards. And if you sign up for the newsletter, it's just done via MailChimp. So if at any point you want to sign out, it's just one click and uh, you're off the list again. But it's, it's super helpful. Um, so I would really recommend that you sign up for the newsletter. Um, if you have any questions about how a coaching engagement works with us, um, or if you want to sign up, then my uh, colleagues detail Sol are here on the screen. So his email address is very easy, info at brilliantwork.nl. I've written down his number here too. Um, and um, I don't think there's anything else. I think, um, uh, Marianne, I didn't know if you wanted to take this or, or not, but definitely from my point of view as well, I really wanted to thank you for, um, for attending. Um, and, um, oh yeah, I'm just reading this on the chat at the moment. Um, you're very welcome, Chris and Yuri. And um, <laughs> yeah, glad to have pointed out the Dutch way of thinking as well. Sometimes that's easier than explaining how everyone else thinks worldwide, just to say, this is how um, how we think here in Holland. So yeah. you're that very welcome. Great, that was a great example, you know? We're not going to say it was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> we really learned a lot. So thank you very much, Lisanne. Uh, I really thought it was a, a great workshop with lots mm -hmm. of uh, examples uh, that will uh, will speak to your uh, your mind and will uh, you know will will work on uh, afterwards. Um, obviously, we we have recorded the entire session, so you're uh, free to um, to look it back or in any parts that you have missed, uh, you can you can look it up later on. I will send an email probably tomorrow, uh, by the time the recording has been uploaded uh, uh, with all the details and obviously also the slide deck and uh, all, um, all necessary information. Can you just pop, uh, pop onto the next slide, Lisanne? Because I just want yeah. to pay attention to uh, the next events that are upcoming. Um, so next week we'll have uh, another workshop online uh, on how to build a successful team. Um, what we find is that uh, usually uh, startup uh, companies uh, uh, are not very uh, critical when they start hiring new people. You know, there's a lot going on and, and uh, you know, you, lots of decisions to be made. So by the time you need uh, support, uh, you just go for the first one available. 
Um, and this workshop is really about what are you as a person, as a founder, as a CEO, um, and, and what kind of people do you need around you to create a, a balanced uh, team? So that's a good one. Uh, and uh, uh, feel free to, uh, to um, register for that. And also on uh, February the 1st, we'll have a company valuation course um, uh, in which you'll, you'll learn how to, uh, to, to really look at the value of your company. Um, you know, obviously, uh, uh, sometimes uh, the, the way you look at your company will vary from uh, how investors will look at it. So um, that's a good workshop to, um, to keep in mind as well. And uh, on the 3rd of February, we'll have a workshop on how to attract venture capital and healthcare. And that's basically for starting companies that are not actually um, on the verge of attracting venture capital yet. But it's good to know in advance what you need to get it in the, in the future or in the near future. So those are the ones that um, um, I just wanted to, uh, to point out to you. Um, so to sum up, thank you very much, Susanna, for your time. And uh, thank you, everybody, for attending this workshop. And um, have a great evening, all of you. And hey. hopefully see you the next time. Bye. Bye.